If you haven't already done so, take the friendship pad and register your attendance with us, especially visitors like to tell you more about our church. Um, as we move into the new year, let's uh, continue to make that resolution to wear our name tags so we can learn one another's names in this place. Our theme the last few weeks has been God calls us and God calls us by name. So that ties in with name tags. So let's remember to wear them and learn them and listen for God's calling us. Today the story of uh, the Apostle Paul. We knew him as Saul when he had his encounter on the Damascus Road. So we've spent some time hearing uh, God's call in these b stories from the Bible. This is our last Sunday before we start moving into the season of Lent. Next Sunday will be what we call Transfiguration Sunday. And then guess what? Ash Wednesday and then on into the season of Lent. So spring is on its way. As we prepare our hearts for worship, uh, will you please stand at, with the sound of the bells and join in their call to worship. Holy One, in our emptiness, in your abundance, with a love that conquers death, we hear your call. Let us worship God. Together. Eternal and gracious God, we praise you, for you are just and true. Your love is with us always. In your grace, you call us to confess our sin and receive your mercy. Many times we have done what we should not have done. We know this is true, so we acknowledge it before you. Many times we have not done what we should have done. We know this is true as well so we admit it in your presence. Help us to answer your call and live as the redeemed, forgiven people of God. Amen. Friends, we have good news to share with one another this Lord's Day. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us and we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. And turn and greet a neighbor and then children, come. Sorry. The reading is from the book of Psalm chapter 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Shoal, restored me to life from among those who've gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger but is for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain 
and hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will I dust, will the dust praise you? Will it let t- me tell you for my faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. This is the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 9 is the text for our New Testament reading for our sermon today. The story of Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The phrase, the road to Damascus, or a Damascus road experience, has taken on a life of its own in language and culture. In fact, the New Oxford American Dictionary defines the road to Damascus as a, a noun, meaning it is used in reference to an important moment of insight, typically one that leads to a dramatic transformation of attitudes or beliefs. And of course, the foundation for the phrase Damascus Road Experience or the Road to Damascus is the story of the Apostle Paul and his story of this encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. To say it was an important moment of insight is a huge understatement. It was a dramatic transformation of attitudes and beliefs. In fact, it was a 180 degree turnaround It'd be like a Trump supporter suddenly campaigning for Joe Biden, or vice versa. The conversion of Paul was even more dramatic than that. It'd be like an IDF soldier joining a ceasefire peace rally, or a Hamas fighter recognizing the right of Israel to exist. It's hard to imagine such transformations, but the Damascus Road story is a reminder that such change is possible. The story of the conversion of Paul is the third in this short sermon series we've had on God's call on our lives. Our first two call stories were of Jonah and Samuel from the Old Testament. Those were powerful stories with much to teach us, but let's admit it. It's hard to relate to those ancient stories, one like being swallowed by a whale or growing up in the temple next to the Ark of the Covenant. Paul's encounter was with Jesus the risen Christ who called his name and turned his life around. A little background on this story is helpful. We're in the ninth chapter of Acts, and the disciples who were with Jesus in his earthly ministry and who witnessed the resurrection are now out preaching the good news, and the early Christian community was growing. As the early church was getting organized, they formed a group called Deacons to take care of the needs of the widows and orphans among them. And one of the first seven deacons they gathered together was someone named Stephen. 
And the religious authorities had arrested Stephen in Acts chapter 7, and he was stoned to death for belonging to this illegal new religious group. Acts says that Saul was present at the stoning of Stephen and that he approved. A little foreshadowing of just how committed he was to stamping out this so-called Jesus movement. Chapter 9 begins by describing Saul as a violent mercenary for the religious authorities. It says he was breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. That phrase, breathing out murderous threats, sounds so ominous, doesn't it? It's like the death threats political leaders or even celebrities get from people who hate what they stand for. Except an email or a tweet is harmless compared to what Saul was willing to do. He even asked for warrants from the authorities to be able to arrest any followers of Jesus, to bring them back to Jerusalem where they would presumably be executed. This was not just someone who had a difference of opinion. He was going to act on his beliefs in a violent way. He was on his mission of hate. And then it happened. The risen Christ decided to get a hold of him and turn him around. The Bible says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why are, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now go up and go, get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So notice here the mention of a bright light that knocked him down and then the blindness of Saul. He had to be led by the hand into Damascus where he was taken to the home of a follower of Jesus called Ananias. The light that got his attention and then his own loss of sight suggests God wanted to give him a new vision for his life. Not only was God going to restore his physical eyesight, God was going to give him a vision that was a complete and total transformation of who he was and what he was going to do with his life. His name was even changed to Paul, and he became the greatest advocate for the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the Mediterranean world. In fact, he wrote much of our New Testament, mostly as letters to churches he planted and the people he mentored from Rome to Ephesus. There's much to study and even to criticize and argue with in the theology of the Apostle Paul as we've come to know him. But he based his life and his ministry on one word, grace. He spoke often of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that could take someone as despicable as him and give his life meaning and purpose. He wrote of God's love in words so eloquent that we quote them today in weddings in 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am nothing. How is this transformation possible? How can someone go from being driven with such hate and violence in his heart to being a servant of the one he persecuted? Well, Paul may be the ultimate example of such transformation, but he is not the only one. Conversion still happens. People change. And sometimes the transformation is absolutely head-spinning. And in our polarized, divided, hate-filled world, it is inspiring to hear such stories. The PBS series Independent Lens has a blog that featured the transformation of neo-Nazis with the title, Reformed Racists is Their Life After Hate for Former White Supremacists. And the first example in this blog was almost as dramatic as the transformation of Paul. In that story, an African-American musician named Daryl Davis is committed to reaching white supremacists by gradually shattering their prejudices with his friendship. It's a complicated, risky, and controversial pursuit, but Davis has succeeded in convincing numerous men to abandon their hatred and become reformed racists. 
One of Daryl's former white supremacist friends is Scott Shepard, who was once a grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, but is now an anti-racism activist who tweets under the handle at Reformed Racist. How did Shepard get from there to here? Shepard said, and I quote, he made it his life's mission, or a quote from the blog, made it his life's mission to defeat the creed he once espoused. The people he once called friends have now sent him death threats, yet he carries on, desperate to atone for the sins of his past. At the Martin Luther King Center, Shepard recently publicly apologized to the family of the slain civil rights leader for all the terrible things he once said about Dr. King. In a video of that discussion, which I've seen, with Daryl Davis alongside him, the Mississippi native revealed that he was raised by an African-American woman and blames having a broken home with an alcoholic father, along with his own self-loathing loathing for why he turned toward the Klan, which was right there in his backyard. Well, there are several other stories of transformation in the blog, and I'll send a link in my email this afternoon so you can read that and watch a couple of videos about that if you like. We need to hear those stories. If a hate-filled, anti-Semitic, racist, white supremacist can turn around and seek reconciliation and healing, then there is hope for our nation and our world. So what do these stories of dramatic transformation mean to you and me? We're not hate-filled racists. We're not breathing murderous threats towards anyone. And yet God still calls us and wants to give us a vision for a new way of living, a way of life filled with grace and love and forgiveness. God called Samuel by name in the middle of the night. God called Saul by name in the middle of the day while he was on the road. God calls us all in various ways and at different times and through different situations. It may through a French, be through a friendship like Scott Shepard and Daryl Davis. It may be through circumstances like a health crisis or a major life event or be, maybe a spiritual encounter through nature or prayer. God has amazingly creative ways to get our attention. Remember the story of Jonah, but we need to listen. We need to listen for God calling our name and then be willing to follow in the direction God wants us to go. And one place we can hear our name is, is at this table. It is set for you and me, and we are each invited and called by name to partake of the bread of life and the cup of salvation. The center aisle we come down may not be the Damascus Road, but it is a place where we can hear the call to follow Jesus and take his message of love and reconciliation to all the people and places in our lives that are stuck in hatred and fear. Listen, can you hear your name? If you make time to listen, you will hear your name. God needs you just as much as God needed Jonah and Samuel and Paul. Different times, different needs, but the same message. Listen for your name. But be careful. Once you hear it, your life will be changed forever. Amen. Let us continue to meditate on these thoughts from Scripture as ushers come to receive our tithes and offerings and we prepare to come to the Lord's table together.
you, Walter, for that beautiful music from Rachmaninoff. <coughs> Great to go out with that bounce in our step and joy in our hearts after being in worship together. It's great to be with the family of God as we start this new month and this new week together. Well, remember that story of the transformation of Paul, and uh, though you maybe think you're not murdering, offering murderous threats to anyone, you're not a racist, you're not a bad person, no, but God can still turn your life into something even more beautiful. Listen for God's call and go and answer that call and watch for the God's vision and guiding you this week, this month, and this year. And now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.